Welcome to the History of English Podcast, a podcast about the history of the English language. This is episode 84, Law, Order, and Murder. In this episode, we're going to explore how French became the language of law and order in England. We know that the Norman conquerors had to impose law and order on their English subjects, so it isn't really surprising that Latin and French words would be so prominent in English law. But the conquerors didn't simply administer English law in French. They actually restructured the entire legal system. The system they established became known as the English Common Law, and it's still the foundation of most legal systems throughout the English-speaking world. That system really has its origins in the reign of Henry II, and it developed in response to the large number of murders and other violent crimes that plagued England during the anarchy. So this time, we'll look at law and order and murder and we'll see how Henry's reforms shaped the English language. But before we begin, let me remind you that the website for the podcast is historyofenglishpodcast.com, and you can sign up to support the podcast at patreon.com. Just go to historyofenglishpodcast.com and link from there. So let's turn to this episode and the development of the English common law. Before I begin, I should note that I originally intended to do a more thorough discussion of this topic, but it's such a big topic that I had to scale it back a bit. So I'm going to focus on the development of criminal law during the 12th century. There were also important developments in the civil law, and I'll touch on that a little bit, but many of those developments are beyond the scope of this episode. So with that, let's pick up where we left off last time. In the last episode, I looked at how the linguistic barriers in England had started to become blurred in the late 1100s. Many nobles were starting to learn English, and many peasants were adding French words to their vocabulary. And in the middle, the knights and bureaucrats were generally bilingual. I concluded the last episode with a quote from a book that was written during the reign of Henry II called The Dialogue Concerning the Exchequer. The text was composed by the head of the exchequer, and he wrote that the Normans and the English had become so mixed together that it was difficult to tell them apart. So you couldn't distinguish the Normans from the English, because the sharp linguistic divide had eroded over time. This passage is quite well known, but what often gets overlooked is the overall context for the quote. The exchequer was the tax collection office. So why were the tax collectors trying to distinguish Normans from Englishmen? Well, the answer is murder. And specifically, the fact that so many Normans had been murdered by Englishmen after the Norman Conquest. The word murder is actually an Old English word, one of the few Old English words still used in modern criminal justice. In Old English, the word was muthor, and it had more of a sense of a secret killing, where the killer was unknown. Interestingly, the Normans had their own version of that word in their Norman French dialect. Their version was mudra, and it also likely came from a Germanic source. Well, after the Norman conquest, it was apparently quite common for Englishmen to murder Normans. The Anglo-Saxons would lie in wait and ambush Normans as they were traveling through the forest. The Norman authorities couldn't identify the killers, so they didn't know how to stop the murders. Ultimately, since they couldn't find and punish the killer, they just decided to punish everyone in the local hundred where the murder took place. They would levy a large fine on the entire hundred, and that fine had to be paid to the exchequer. The idea was to try to force the local community to identify the murderer. But if they didn't, the exchequer collected a hefty fee. And that's why the exchequer was interested in murder. But here's the thing. That fine only applied to the murder of a Norman. It didn't apply to the murder of an Englishman. So that distinction was very important, because it determined whether or not the fine was levied. But the head of the exchequer tells us that it was no longer possible to distinguish Normans from Englishmen in the late 1100s. So the rule had to be changed. The victim's ethnicity no longer mattered. The murder fine was levied for all murders where the killer was unknown. So, if we read between the lines, we can tell that murder had been an ongoing problem since the conquest. And that problem was only made worse by the breakdown of law and order during the anarchy. With little fear of punishment, criminals ran wild. Murder, rape, robbery, and assault were commonplace. And that was the general state of things when Henry II became king in 1154. 
Now, you may be wondering what the police were doing while all these criminals were running wild. Well, the answer to that question is simple. There was no police. Neither the Anglo-Saxons nor the Normans had a police force. Since there was no specific police force, the people had to police themselves. And this may not seem very practical, but a specific type of community policing had been around since the time of Canute in the Anglo-Saxon period. In its initial form, the system was built around groups of ten neighbors, or ten men, who were required to keep an eye on each other. Each member was responsible for the good behavior of the others in the group. Since it was based on the number ten, each of these groups was called a tithing. But over time, the actual number of people in the group varied. It expanded from ten men to ten households. And in later times, the group was sometimes all of the people living in a particular hamlet or in a particular neighborhood. All of the members took a pledge to ensure that everyone in the group obeyed the law and acted with good behavior. They agreed to report any member of the group who committed a crime. And they also agreed to detain the suspect and deliver him to the local officials who were in charge of punishment. If the suspect got away, the entire group had to compensate the victim. So you can see where the Normans got the idea of punishing an entire group for the wrongful action of a single member. So this old system of community policing depended on people spying on each other and telling on each other. This system was called the Frithborch in Old English, a term that literally meant the peace pledge. It was a pledge to keep the peace. After the conquest, the Normans largely maintained this system, but they translated that Old English term into French. And in French, it came to be known as the Frank Pledge. Ultimately, community policing like the Frank Pledge had the same objective as any other type of policing. It was designed to deter criminal activity and to report and detain those who were suspected of crimes. So what type of crimes did these groups try to prevent? Well, first of all, let's establish that the word crime is a French word. So in Anglo-Saxon England, a guilty person didn't commit a crime. He or she committed a sin. And that word still survives as the word sin. Today, the word sin has a more limited meaning. It means a violation of a religious rule or law. But in Old English, it meant any kind of legal violation. After the French word crime was borrowed, the word sin became restricted to the more specific religious sense. Other Old English words for a bad or criminal act were mandad and fierin. Both of those words also disappeared after the word crime was borrowed. So what type of sins or crimes might someone commit? Well, we've already seen that a person might commit murther or murder. As I noted earlier, that Old English word survived in part because the Normans had their own version of that word, murder. So the two forms of the word blended together into the modern word murder. In fact, it appears that the D sound in the middle of the word murder came from the Norman version of the word. Sometimes a person would attack and injure another person without killing them. In that situation, the attacker might be detained and accused of abrakin, literally breaking another person. Another term for a violent attack was a firindad, literally a violent deed. These Old English terms, abrakin and firindad, were eventually replaced with French terms, like assault and battery. A person might be accused of taking someone else's property. The Old English word for taking someone's property was theft, and that word survives as the word theft. The Anglo-Saxons also had the word stalen, which survives as the word steal. The word reaflac was a related word that meant robbery, where one person robbed another person by force or threat. Sometimes a criminal would break into another person's house to steal something. This was called husbricha, literally house breaching or house breaking. Terms like reaflac and husbricha have disappeared, but theft and steal have survived. Now, even though theft and steal have survived, we don't tend to use them as technical legal terms. Instead, we tend to use borrowed French terms like larceny, robbery, and burglary. A person might also be accused of burning someone's house or property. This was called bernina, literally burning. Once again, the Old English term was eventually replaced with the French word arson. 
Sometimes a person was accused of committing a sin against God or the laws of nature. A person who had two or more wives was accused of tweeweefing, literally, two-wifing. Again, the name of that crime was later replaced with the French word bigamy. A person might also be accused of having a relationship with a close family member. This was sibleche, literally, sib-lying, lying with one's sibling or family member. Again, the name of this crime was later replaced with a French term, incest. So, as we can see, early England had many of the same basic crimes that we have today, but the old English terms for those crimes were largely replaced with specific legal terms borrowed from French. Now, when a person was accused of a crime, he or she was detained. In Old English, the term was theophang, or haften. Those terms were eventually replaced with French terms, detain and arrest. By the way, arrest was literally to bring to arrest, to stop someone who might be fleeing. I should also note that the French sense of the word rest was to stop or remain in place. Old English also had a similar word rest that meant to lie down or sleep, as in, you look tired, go get some rest. The Old English word and the French word gradually merged into the modern word rest, which resulted in one word with two similar but slightly different meanings. Anyway, the word arrest, as in to stop or detain, was based on the French version. After a person was arrested, he or she had an opportunity to either admit or deny the charges. To admit the charge was undetten in Old English. It was eventually replaced with the French word confess. A confession led to immediate punishment, so most people accused of a crime denied the charge. Either way, the official position was eventually given a French name, the plea. So when the person denied the charges, some type of trial was required to determine actual guilt or innocence. Again, the word trial comes from French. In Old English, it was called asha. In criminal matters, there was no jury, and actual evidence was of little importance. This was true in Anglo-Saxon England as well as Norman England. Justice was medieval, and by that I mean that it was determined in the same way that it had always been determined, usually by ordeal. I mentioned the word ordeal way back in the early episodes about the Germanic tribes. That was the traditional way of determining guilt or innocence and it was still the primary method used in England when Henry II came to power in the 1100s. The ordeal was a physical test. It usually involved either heat or water. In some cases, the accused had to stick his hand into a pot of boiling water. This was called yesod in Old English. Sometimes the accused had to grab a piece of red-hot iron. Either option produced a severe burn and after a few days, the wounds would be examined to see how they were healing. If they were healing cleanly, God had rendered his judgment, and the person was deemed to be innocent. If the wounds were not healing cleanly, the person was deemed to be guilty. So the result was completely arbitrary. It didn't have anything to do with the actual evidence of the crime or the facts of the case. By the way, this type of trial by hot water is widely believed to be the origin of the phrase to be in hot water, meaning to be in trouble. So if you do something wrong, you might find yourself in hot water. But at least you won't literally find yourself in hot water like you would have a thousand years ago. There were other types of ordeals as well, like blessing the water in a lake and lowering a suspect into the water with his hands and legs tied to see if the water accepted him or rejected him. If he floated, he was guilty. If he sank, he was innocent which wasn't much consolation if he drowned, which sometimes happened. As I've noted before, the term ordeal still survives in the English language. It still means a difficult or trying situation, but it's lost its original association with criminal trials. Regardless of the type of ordeal, I think you can see the problem here. Criminal trials weren't really based on facts or evidence. They were based on a physical test which produced arbitrary results. Wounds that healed cleanly were proof that a suspect was innocent. And again, innocent is a French word. The Anglo-Saxons would have used the Old English word sweeken. Now, unclean or infected wounds were proof of guilt. And guilt is actually an Old English word. It's one of the few modern legal terms which has survived from Old English. 
French had the word culpable, and that word culpable was borrowed into English, but the native word guilty remains the more dominant term. I should note that the French word culpable did survive in one context in modern legalese. You might not realize it, but it's part of the word culprit. Unlike today, a suspect was not presumed to be innocent in Norman England. It was the opposite. He was presumed to be guilty. So when a suspect denied a charge, the justice official would declare that the person was culpable, and the court was pressed or ready to prove the charge. Since this standard reply always began with the words culpable and pressed, it was often written down in the official records as C U L dot P R I T. Since culpability was presumed, it became standard practice to refer to the accused as the culprit based on this standard annotation. But outside of that context, we tend to use the word guilty in criminal pleas today. So that was the basic criminal procedure in Anglo-Saxon and Norman England. And I think a few things stand out. There was community policing rather than a trained police force. There was no formal indictment of a suspect, just an accusation of wrongdoing, which may or may not have had any legitimate basis. And guilt or innocence was not based on facts or evidence. It was based on a physical test. That meant that innocent people were sometimes convicted, and guilty people were sometimes freed to commit more crimes. I should also note that a determination of guilt usually meant a very quick and very harsh punishment. In the early Anglo-Saxon period, the guilty party had to compensate the victim or the victim's family with the payment of the wergeld, which was literally the man money. But as English society became less tribal, the wergeld wasn't considered a sufficient punishment or deterrent. So, in the late Anglo-Saxon period, there was an emphasis on other forms of punishment. Especially for serious crimes like murder, for those crimes, the guilty person was often put to death or mutilated. In other cases, the criminal might be banished or outlawed, but he wasn't sentenced to prison, because that type of punishment didn't really exist yet. A person might be detained in stocks or in some other place until a trial could be had, but after the trial, a more severe form of punishment was usually imposed. Prison wasn't really used as a punishment until the late 1500s, and that helps to explain why the words jail and prison are both French words, because they were both borrowed during the Middle English period. As I've noted, this was the nature of criminal justice during both the Anglo-Saxon period and the Norman period. After the conquest, the Normans didn't replace the Anglo-Saxon system. They kept the basic structure, and most of the English terminology was gradually replaced with French terminology. Though the basic structure remained the same, the Normans did make a few modifications to the Anglo-Saxon system. The biggest change they introduced had to do with the venues for those legal proceedings. Traditionally, in Anglo-Saxon England, most legal disputes were heard and resolved in the local courts of the Shire and the Hundred. These were the traditional local courts. And around this time, the term shire was being replaced with the French word county, so the shire courts were also starting to be known as the county courts. Now, separate and apart from the local courts of the shire and the hundred, the king also had his own court called the curia regis. This was basically the Norman version of the old Anglo-Saxon witan. It was a group of prominent officials and barons who advised the king. But beyond its political purpose, it was also a court. It could settle legal disputes and decide criminal cases. But it had so much other business to attend to that it only dealt with the most serious legal matters, usually those involving the barons or other prominent nobles. So the Normans had the traditional courts of the shires and the hundreds, and they had the king's court, which played a more limited role. But then the Normans allowed a wide variety of new courts to be created. For example, towns and cities were growing, and many of those towns established their own courts to deal with crimes and settle disputes among the townspeople. And as I noted in an earlier episode, the feudal system allowed for the growth of manors throughout the countryside. The manors were allowed to set up their own courts to regulate the behavior of the peasants who lived on the manor. By controlling these manor courts, the lords could effectively control their peasants. So now, after the conquest, there were lots of different courts, 
but they weren't really part of a hierarchy. For the most part, they all acted independently of each other, and they didn't have a common legal code. Each tended to rely on local custom and tradition, which was the standard practice throughout Western Europe at the time. So there were courts all over the place, each doing their own thing. And then the Normans created another whole new set of courts, the church courts, also called the ecclesiastical courts. The church did have a set of written rules, what was known as church canon, and the church held large tracts of land, just like the barons. So church officials wanted the right to have their own courts where they could apply canon law. William the Conqueror permitted this arrangement, and a whole new set of church courts popped up around the country. The power of the church courts expanded under Stephen's reign during the anarchy. Those courts heard cases involving the general public if it concerned canon law. So that included matters like marriage, divorce, inheritance, heresy, and witchcraft. But the most important business before the church courts were criminal matters involving the clergy. If a member of the clergy was accused of a crime, even a violent crime, like assault or robbery or murder, he had a right to be tried in a church court. And that's exactly what he would have wanted, because the church courts didn't really provide much in the way of punishment. The death penalty wasn't allowed there. So if a cleric committed a crime, even murder, there was little the church courts could do other than demote the cleric or kick him out of the church altogether. It was a slap on the wrist. Now, you don't have to be a lawyer to realize that this created a major loophole in the law. England was now a country filled with a variety of courts. Royal courts, shire courts, hundred courts, manor courts, and borough courts. All of them could provide a harsh and brutal punishment. But then there were the church courts, where you could essentially get away with murder, both figuratively and literally. All you had to do was show that you were a member of the clergy. So how did you do that? Well, it was actually quite easy. Even someone in a minor order who had never been ordained could claim the protection of the church. The test was really a linguistic test. If you were a member of the clergy, you probably had a church education. And that meant that you could speak and understand at least some Latin. So one way to prove that you were a member of the clergy was to recite a specific passage from the book of Psalms in Latin. If you could do that, you could have your case moved to the church courts. So guess what many criminals did? They memorized that passage in Latin, just in case they needed a get-out-of-jail-free card. By the time Henry II came to power, it was estimated that about one in six people in England could claim status as a clergyman under the rules in place at the time. And in a period when murder was rampant, a lot of the killers claimed the protection afforded by this loophole. In the year 1163, an English historian named William of Newburgh estimated that over a hundred murders had been committed in the prior decade by people who technically qualified as clergymen. So this was the situation that Henry II inherited when he became king in 1154. With a general breakdown of law and order during the anarchy, crime had spiked, especially violent crime like murders, and many criminals avoided major punishment in the church courts. One of the reasons why law and order had broken down was because the old Frank Pledge system had declined during the anarchy. Remember that the Frank Pledge was the community policing system. Everyone had to be part of a group called a tithing, and each member was responsible for policing the others. But during the anarchy, that system had broken down. For one thing, a lot of people had stopped being a part of the tithing groups altogether. And so a lot of people lived outside of those groups, especially criminals. So there was no one to report those criminals to the local sheriff. And even when people did remain a part of those groups, the members often looked the other way when a crime was committed. These were close-knit groups, and many crimes were considered to be justified during the hardship of the anarchy. A starving man might have to steal to provide for his family. So his fellow tithing members often kept their mouths shut and looked the other way. But without effective community policing, there was little policing at all. So one of Henry's first objectives was to get the Frank Pledge system back up and running. The sheriff of each county was directed to make sure that every unfree person was a member of a Frank Pledge group. And twice a year, the local hundred court would meet and take account of all unfree persons and make sure that they were assigned to a specific group. This was called the View of the Frank Pledge. 
This reform helped to reinstate community policing in the countryside, but it had a limited effect. A lot of people still looked the other way. You could force people into these groups, but you couldn't make them report criminal activity if they didn't want to. The other problem is that this reform didn't close that huge loophole created by the church courts. Many criminals could still claim protection in those courts. So Henry knew that he had to find a way to improve community policing and to close that church loophole. And he also knew that church officials would strongly oppose any effort to restrict the power of the church. Then, in the year 1162, eight years into Henry's reign, he saw an opportunity to take on the church regarding some of these issues. In that year, the Archbishop of Canterbury died, and Henry had the right to put forward a successor. So Henry looked around for a successor who might be willing to go along with his plans to take on the church. As Henry considered his options, one person in particular stood out, his good friend and chancellor, Thomas Becket. I mentioned Beckett in the last episode. He was one of Henry's first appointments, and Beckett quickly became one of Henry's closest companions and friends. He shared Henry's view that law and order needed to be returned to the country, and that required an expansion of the king's power and authority. As chancellor, Beckett was responsible for issuing the king's writs and charters. He became Henry's primary legal advisor, and at this point, the chancellor and the chancery were still part of the king's household. So Becket traveled the country with Henry as a member of his court. As Henry considered the vacancy in Canterbury, he realized that Becket was his best option for a successor. Becket would ensure that the head of the English church was an ally, or so he thought. Becket was officially named as the archbishop in the year 1162, and initially Becket retained his position as chancellor. At first, everything seemed to be working according to Henry's plan, but shortly after Becket became archbishop, he resigned his position as chancellor. That decision caught everyone by surprise, and that was the first red flag that Henry had made a mistake. Becket's resignation made it clear that he wasn't going to be Henry's yes-man. Becket threw himself into his new job, and that job meant opposing any attempt to restrict the power of the church. And since Henry had plans to do just that, it started to become apparent that the two friends were on a collision course. Over the next few months, Henry and Beckett butted heads over several matters, but the big fallout occurred about a year after Beckett became Archbishop. At an initial meeting in Westminster, Henry proposed a plan that restricted the power of those church courts. It was a bit of a compromise. The church court could still conduct the trial of a clergyman to determine if he was guilty or innocent. But if he was found guilty, the clergyman had to be turned over to the king's court where the man would be executed. The idea was that a guilty cleric was stripped of his clerical authority. So at that point, he was simply a lay person and could be punished like anyone else. But Beckett objected to the proposal on the grounds that it constituted double punishment for the same crime. Despite Beckett's opposition, Henry wasn't going to give up. A few months later, in January of 1164, he summoned a great council to his hunting lodge and palace at Clarendon in the south of England. This was a meeting of both church officials and nobles, and this time Henry put his plans in writing. He submitted a document which came to be known as the Constitutions of Clarendon. It contained 16 separate clauses that more clearly defined the relationship between church law and secular law. But the provision that drew the most ire was that provision dealing with criminal clerics and Henry's attempt to close that loophole created by the church courts. Beckett strongly opposed those provisions, and he refused to let Henry have his way. Henry was furious at the opposition, especially given that Beckett was his former friend and the fact that Beckett owed his position to Henry. At that point, Henry had had enough of Beckett's opposition and he formulated a plan to get rid of Beckett altogether. Henry put Beckett on trial for contempt. The charges were mostly trumped up. Beckett was accused of intentionally delaying justice in a land dispute, which Beckett initially acknowledged. But then he was accused of failing to account for certain monies as chancellor. And this was a surprise allegation, and Beckett wasn't prepared to defend it. He probably couldn't have accounted for the money anyway by that point. 
In response, Becket railed against the assembly. He said that the king's court had no authority over him as archbishop, and he only had to answer to the pope. But Henry pronounced judgment against Becket anyway. That night, while Becket awaited his sentence, he decided to flee to France. So Becket went into exile. And even though Becket was now in France, the dispute between Henry and the church continued to rage on. The role of the church courts remained unresolved, and murder and violence remained an ongoing problem. As I noted earlier, Henry had required that all unfree persons be a part of a tithing or frank pledge group, but that didn't guarantee that the members would tell on each other. So violent crimes were still being committed throughout the countryside, with very few suspects being turned in. Henry needed to find a way to break through that wall of secrecy and get people to turn in criminals. In the year 1166, Henry addressed this problem with a new set of rules called the Assize of Clarendon, not to be confused with the earlier Constitutions of Clarendon, which led to that conflict with Becket. These new rules required that a group of twelve men be assembled in each hundred in each shire. Once they were assembled, they had to swear an oath to tell the truth, and then they were to report anyone who had been accused or suspected of being a robber, thief, or murderer, and anyone who had given shelter to a robber, thief, or murderer. It meant that a criminal no longer had the protection of his particular frank pledge group. A random group of twelve people from the general community could accuse a suspect of a crime. This meant that anyone in the community with a reputation for criminal activity could now be identified and turned in. Now, if you live in the United States, this procedure may sound vaguely familiar, because this type of assembly became known as the grand jury, and it became the standard way to indict criminals in English common law. It was later repealed in Britain and the British colonies, but that was well after the United States became an independent nation. So it was retained in the United States, and in fact, it's part of the U.S. Constitution. The Fifth Amendment specifically requires a grand jury indictment for felonies in federal proceedings. So the grand jury was a byproduct of the anarchy and the crime wave that ensued, and it was created at this point in history by Henry II. Now, juries were not a new concept. I noted in an earlier episode that the Normans had used juries shortly after the conquest. But the original concept behind the jury was very different from what we see here. The Normans didn't use juries in legal cases or trials. They just used them for administrative purposes. For example, when the Doomsday Book was being assembled, William the Conqueror needed to get a grip on things and figure out who owned what. So he summoned a local nobleman to investigate and report back to the Norman officials. This assembly was a jury, but it was merely a fact-finding group. What Henry II did here was to apply this same basic concept to the legal system. A group of twelve lawful men was to gather the information about potential criminals and report that information to the local sheriff or royal judges. But the important point here is that this new type of jury merely accused someone of committing a crime. They didn't determine guilt or innocence. That was still done by the ordeal. So this assembly, which we would later call a grand jury, merely made an accusation. It didn't decide guilt or innocence. It was merely a way to correct some of the problems with the frank pledge system. So what were the consequences of these new rules? Well, for one, they actually worked. And by worked, I mean that they resulted in more people being accused of crimes. But that meant that those people were forced to endure the ordeal. So a lot of people accused of crimes went into hiding. In fact, court records suggest that most of the accused suspects went into hiding, usually in the forests. And when an accused person went into hiding, they were declared an outlaw. So the number of outlaws went up after these rules were adopted. And that contributed to an increased interest in the legends of outlaws, like Robin Hood. So in some ways, these rules contributed to the rise of Robin Hood as a folk hero. Another consequence was the new role of the jury in criminal trials. Again, Henry didn't let the jury decide actual guilt or innocence. He only let the jury make a formal accusation or indictment. But about 50 years later, in the year 1215, the church formally barred priests from participating in ordeals. And without priests, an ordeal couldn't be conducted. 
because an ordeal was the judgment of God, and a priest had to bless the instrument of the ordeal. So that meant that officials had to come up with a new way to determine if a suspect was guilty or innocent. And their solution was to expand the role of the jury even further. The juries were allowed to hear evidence and decide if the suspect had actually committed the crime or not. And that was a big deal because it meant that guilt or innocence was based on facts and evidence, not just a random physical test. So after 1215, there were two types of juries. Juries that merely accused someone of committing a crime and juries that actually heard the case and determined guilt. To distinguish these two types of juries, French-speaking jurists called the first type the big jury, or grand jury. They called the second type of jury the little jury, or the petite jury. Over time, the grand jury became the grand jury, and the petite jury became the petty jury. The term petty jury has largely fallen out of use, and today the second jury is simply known as the jury or the trial jury. But once again, all of those terms are from French. Also, I noted that the rules implemented by Henry II specifically required that the members of the grand jury had to swear an oath to tell the truth. And that's also kind of important because the word jury derives from a Latin word that meant to swear. So a jury was literally the people who swore an oath to tell the truth at an inquest. And that's why someone who lies under oath commits perjury, which is the word jury with the Latin prefix per, meaning against. So perjury is literally against or contrary to an oath to tell the truth. So it's a lie under oath. One last note about the grand jury before I move on. I noted that the initial rules were aimed at robbery, theft, and murder. Well, about ten years later, Henry expanded the jurisdiction of the grand jury to include counterfeiting, forgery, and arson. All French terms, by the way. These were also considered major crimes. So that meant that the grand jury dealt with most major crimes, but not minor crimes. And this distinction is still with us today. Today we call a major crime a felony. Again, a word borrowed from French. And a minor crime is a misdemeanor, also a French term. By the way, misdemeanor comes from the same root as the word menace. So thanks to these reforms, we got the grand jury and the introduction of the jury to criminal justice. And as I noted, the grand jury later expanded to become the trial jury. And when the trial jury came into being, it meant that trials were based more on facts and evidence rather than arbitrary physical tests. So this was a big step from medieval justice to a more modern criminal justice system. It also produced more indictments and corrected some of the weaknesses associated with the Frank Pledge. But there was still that big loophole, the church courts. Even if a person was charged with murder, he could still seek trial in a church court if he could show that he was a member of the clergy and that meant a slap on the wrist compared to the other courts. With Thomas Becket still in exile in France, the matter couldn't really be resolved. So in the year 1167, the year after Henry implemented his grand jury reforms, he issued an ordinance that required all clerics residing in France to return to England if they had revenues in England. If they failed to return, they would forfeit those revenues. It was partially designed to lure Becket back to England, but it actually had much broader consequences. Even though Becket did not immediately return, many other clerics did, especially those at the University of Paris, which was one of the first universities in Europe. When they returned to England, those clerical scholars mostly settled in Oxford. Schools were set up there to accommodate them, and this is often cited as the beginning of Oxford University. There are some vague references to a school there before this date, but this is really the point when Oxford gets started. And I'll have a lot more to say about the rise of universities in an upcoming episode. I should also note that this particular year, 1167, was important for another reason. This was the year that Henry's mother, Matilda, died. She had been living in retirement in Normandy for several years, but she finally passed in this year. This was also the year that William Marshall's career really took off. I mentioned him in the episode about knights, 
and I noted that he became the most famous knight in all of England. Well, in 1167, he took part in a campaign to suppress a rebellion in Poitou in France. William was wounded and taken prisoner, but his conduct was so courageous that he attracted the attention of Henry's wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, and she paid William's ransom, and a couple of years later he was placed in charge of Henry and Eleanor's eldest son, also named Henry. William supervised the boy's military training, and in the following year, 1170, Henry II decided to crown his son as the future King of England. This was a customary practice back in France, and it was done in order to ensure a smooth and peaceful succession whenever Henry died. But there was one major problem with Henry's plan. A coronation ceremony was supposed to be consecrated by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Archbishop, Thomas Becket, was in France, and he showed no signs of returning. So in June, Henry went forward with the coronation ceremony anyway. Instead of using Becket, he had the Archbishop of York and several other bishops consecrate the ceremony at Westminster Abbey. Now this was a major insult to Becket, and by all accounts Becket was outraged, and probably jealous that the other clerics had usurped his role in the ceremony. So in response, Becket threatened to lay England under ban of interdict, which would literally mean that all of England's churches would be closed. By this point, it had become apparent that the two former friends needed to find some kind of resolution to their ongoing conflict. In July, Henry and Becket met each other face-to-face in France to try to work out their differences. The meeting actually went very well, and both sides agreed to reconcile. Becket was allowed to return to England to resume his duties as archbishop, and his lands were restored to him. But there was no agreement about the role of the church courts, which had been one of the main sources of conflict. Becket returned to Canterbury, and on Christmas Day of the same year, 1170, he took to the pulpit at the cathedral there and gave his sermon. At the end of the sermon, he excommunicated all of the bishops who had participated in the coronation ceremony of Henry's son, including the Archbishop of York. And that was really the breaking point for Henry. Henry was in Normandy at the time, and when he heard that Becket had excommunicated all of the rival bishops, he hit the roof. He railed against Becket. Henry was surrounded by his various knights and attendants. And in the course of that tirade, he made a very infamous statement. Supposedly, Henry said, Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? This quote actually comes from an account written down several centuries later. A more reliable quote probably comes from Edward Grimm, a priest on Becket's staff. He reported that Henry railed against Becket and said, What miserable drones and traitors have I nourished and promoted in my household? who let their lord be treated with such shameful contempt by a low-born cleric. Well, regardless of what Henry actually said, it was apparently interpreted as a call to action by several knights in attendance. Four of the knights immediately left Henry's court and crossed the channel to England to confront Becket in person. They found Becket inside the cathedral at Canterbury. At first, they tried to detain him and force him to return to France to face the king's wrath but Becket refused. The knights left and returned later. When Becket refused them for a second time, they lashed out in anger and slashed him with their swords. It was a brutal attack, and when it was done, Becket lay on the cathedral floor with his head slashed open. The knights fled the cathedral, and Becket died later that afternoon. For several years, Becket had tried to protect the rights of the church, but in the process, he also inadvertently protected clerics who had committed murder. Now Becket himself was a victim of murder. It was a murder that shocked Western Europe, and it made Becket a martyr. By all accounts, Henry was shocked and devastated when he heard the news. Most historians agree that Henry did not actually order Becket's death, but he did bear some of the responsibility, given that his knights committed the murder and they were acting on his words. Henry was content to force Becket's resignation or removal, but he didn't want Becket murdered because he knew that he could never defeat a martyr. Within two years, the Pope had canonized Becket, making him St. Thomas, and a cult immediately grew around the new saint. 
His shrine at Canterbury became one of the most popular destinations for European pilgrims. Henry himself eventually made a pilgrimage to Becket's shrine and did penance for the late archbishop's death. Of course, Becket's shrine at Canterbury is very important to the history of Middle English because a couple of centuries later, a poet named Geoffrey Chaucer decided to compose a series of tales about various pilgrims who were making their way to that shrine. Of course, we know that collection of stories as the Canterbury Tales, and it's generally regarded as the most well-known and most important text in the entire period of Middle English. And we'll certainly look much closer at Chaucer's tales when we get to the 1300s. So we now know Becket's fate. But what about Henry's? Well, Henry survived the whole messy conflict, but it left a permanent stain on his legacy. Henry ruled for nearly twenty more years, but he was never able to erase the cloud over his reign caused by Becket's death. Henry ultimately reached a settlement with the church after Becket died. The church courts were allowed to remain, but their jurisdiction was scaled back. They could continue to try clergymen accused of felonies, but clergymen accused of treason or misdemeanors could be tried in the king's royal courts. And the royal courts were also given the right to determine if a person was in fact a member of the clergy. So Henry was able to chip away at the jurisdiction of the church courts. I should note that those ecclesiastical courts technically remained in place for over six more centuries. The right of a clergyman to be tried in a church court wasn't completely repealed until 1826. Though Henry had to make concessions on the issue of church courts, he did retain the right to appoint bishops and other high church officials throughout his realm. This enabled Henry to place allies in prominent church positions, and that gave him a certain amount of influence over the church despite some of his concessions. He also continued to push through other legal reforms which expanded the scope of the royal courts and ultimately reduced the power of the church courts. I've elected to focus on the development of criminal law during Henry's reign, but in the years that followed Becket's death, Henry issued a series of reforms that impacted the entire legal system of England. Six years later, he issued a series of rules in the so-called Assize of Northampton. These rules directed that royal judges be sent around the country to actually hear and try cases, not just to supervise the local courts. So this expanded the king's court's deep into the countryside, and it weakened the traditional role of the local courts of the hundreds and shires and manors. At about the same time, Henry issued other reforms that expanded the role of the jury even further. As we've seen, the concept of the grand jury had been established at the Assize of Clarendon, but that jury just made accusations. It didn't determine guilt or innocence. Well, now Henry's reforms permitted most civil matters, like land disputes, to be decided by a jury. So now the jury was being used to find the facts and render a final decision on the matters. And as I noted earlier, this expanded role of the jury was extended to criminal trials after Henry's death when the ordeal fell out of use. Henry's reforms also helped to establish a standard civil procedure in lawsuits. And when a decision was rendered, the rulings started to be written down and preserved for posterity. Those rulings served as precedent to be followed in future disputes. These reforms made royal justice available throughout the country to all free persons, and it became so popular that the royal courts gradually replaced most of the various local courts. People preferred the royal courts because they provided a quick resolution, and the rulings were often more consistent since they tended to be based on fixed rules and precedent. As the royal courts expanded, their standard rules gradually replaced the various unwritten customs of the local courts, and local law gave way to a standard common law throughout England. This was the birth of the English common law system, which became the basis of English law going forward. As I noted, the royal courts gradually expanded their jurisdiction throughout the countryside, and in the process, the role of the local county and hundred courts diminished. This had important linguistic consequences as well. Since these were royal courts, supervised and managed by royal justices, it meant that the trials were generally conducted in Latin or French. The local courts may have been more likely to use English, at least in part, but the royal courts didn't. 
As I noted last time, French was increasingly used as a written language. And after the year 1275, written laws in England were usually drawn up in French. In fact, for about two centuries after Henry's reforms, most trials in England were conducted in French. And that's why the French legal terms gradually replaced the old English terms. That made it difficult for native English speakers to participate in the proceedings and understand what was going on. Also, the royal courts were centered in Westminster and traveled the country. So very often, a required legal proceeding was conducted in some other part of the country. And this created the need for an expert to handle the legal matter. This was a person trained in the law and trained in Latin and French. This person could advise the person on the law and travel to other parts of the country where the justices might be holding court. Of course, this was the beginning of the legal profession as we know it today. There's no evidence of lawyers during the time of Henry II, but within about a decade of his death, we have the first evidence of lawyers in the official records of the king's court, the Curia Regis. Those records contain the names of specific lawyers who represented clients before the court. By the year 1275, the legal profession had grown so much that a law had to be enacted to regulate the profession. The Statute of Westminster required punishment for lawyers who were found guilty of deceit. Today, members of the legal profession are known by a variety of names, such as lawyer, attorney, solicitor, and barrister. All of those terms are derived from French, except lawyer, which is based on the word law. As we've seen before, law is actually a Norse word borrowed during the period of Old English. In early Middle English, the Norse word law got the French suffix yer, and that produced lawyer, which later became lawyer. The word lawyer appeared around the same time as the word attorney. Attorney appeared in the early 1300s, and it was based on the same Latin root that gave us the word turn. That root also gave us the words tournament and tornado, which I mentioned in the episode about knights. A tornado refers to twisting and turning winds, and a tournament refers to the twisting and turning motion of the mounted knights on the field as they charged at each other. So what does that have to do with lawyers? Well, if you have a problem and you turn it over to someone else to handle it for you, they are your attorney. By the way, an attorney doesn't have to be a lawyer. It can be anyone who handles the matter for you. That's why you can give power of attorney to a family member or a friend. An attorney that handles a legal matter became known as an attorney at law. In other words, a legal attorney. The term attorney at law gradually shortened to just attorney. And the word attorney became synonymous with the word lawyer, especially in the United States. That development didn't tend to happen as much in Britain. So that's part of the reason why the word attorney isn't generally used for lawyers in the UK. Another reason why the word attorney isn't generally used in the UK is because its association with lawyers gave it a negative connotation in British English. This negative connotation was so strong in Britain in the late 1800s that a law was enacted to deal with the problem. As part of the Judicature Act of 1873, the term attorney was phased out in the legal profession, and it merged with the term solicitor. Now, since I'm discussing the word attorney, I should note the French influence in a term like attorney general. Not only are both words in that term from French, but the way they're put together is also from French. In English, we tend to put the adjective before the noun, so we might refer to a respected attorney, or an experienced attorney, or perhaps a crooked attorney. But French puts the adjective after the noun. So in a formal title like attorney general, we follow the French rule. So we have attorney general rather than the general attorney. We see that same French construction in other borrowed phrases like court martial rather than the martial court and battle royal rather than the royal battle. So by the end of the 1300s, we had the words lawyer and attorney. As this new legal profession grew, many students sought to enter the profession, but they had to be trained and given a formal education in the law. Part of that education included practice at trying cases in mock trials presided over by real judges and established lawyers. 
In the practice courtrooms and in the real courtrooms, the judges were separated from the rest of the hall by a railing or barrier known as the bar. As students progressed and gained experience and standing, they were invited to join the judges and help preside over the trials. When this happened, it was said that the student had been called within the bar, and over time, the legal profession itself became known as the bar. So today, we would say that the student had joined the bar. And a particular type of attorney who was skilled in litigation and trial practice was called a barrister from the word bar. The word barrister first appeared in the 1500s, around the same time as the word solicitor. As I noted, the word solicitor took some of that more general sense of the word attorney. So a solicitor is someone who does more general legal work, like advising clients and handling cases in the lower courts. A barrister is a more specialized trial lawyer, usually one who works in higher courts. Again, the American legal profession doesn't really make these distinctions in the same way, and it doesn't use the term barrister. Now, let's be honest. The legal profession hasn't always had the best reputation, and that's led to some pejorative terms for lawyers. I noted that the word attorney acquired a negative connotation in Britain and that it was largely dropped in favor of the term solicitor. In the 1500s, another word for an attorney or representative of another person was a factor, and a lawyer who handled petty cases was called a petty factor. But English also had the word fogger, which meant a huckster or small-time crook. So English speakers combined petty factor and fogger into the word pettifogger, which meant a crooked lawyer. Another pejorative term for a lawyer in the 1600s was ambidexter. In Latin, ambi meant both, and dexter meant right-handed. Now today we have this term as ambidextrous, and it refers to someone who can use their right hand and left hands equally. Since most people are right-handed, it's like having two right hands, and that's why the term ambidextrous literally means two right-handedness. Well, that adjective ambidextrous actually comes from the noun ambidexter, and an ambidexter was someone who could use both of their hands equally. But its first known use was in reference to crooked lawyers, those who took bribes with both hands. Specifically, it meant a lawyer who took a bribe from both sides of a dispute. So he took money from his client and from the opposing party. So an ambidexter was originally a double-dealing lawyer. Now, some unethical lawyers are known for double-dealing, but almost all lawyers are known for double-talk. That's the way you say one thing but mean another. Well, someone who was skilled at that type of double talk, like a lawyer, was said to be ambiloquent. It combined that same root, ambi, meaning both, with the word locor, meaning talk. It's the same root that we find in the word eloquent. But here we have ambiloquent, literally both talking, or talking from both sides of the mouth. So again, all of these terms, even the pejorative ones, come from Latin and French. And as I noted, the English legal profession was conducted in Latin and French, especially French, so lawyers were a necessity for most people. But in the year 1362, about two centuries after the reforms of Henry II, a law was passed in England called the Statute of Pleadings. After two centuries, French finally started to give way to English in the courts of England. The statute of pleadings required all pleadings and testimony to be given in English, not French. So you may think this was a big step forward for the English language in the English courts, but the impact wasn't as great as you might think. The statute itself was written in French, and it provided that judgments be recorded in Latin. So you gave evidence in English, but your words were then translated and written down for the official record in Latin. Despite this statute, there are reports of English lawyers still conducting trials in French as late as the mid-1500s. So in this episode, we've seen how Henry II helped to shape the legal system which became known as English common law. These reforms standardized law around the country. And even though this was a uniquely English form of law, the practice of that law was conducted in French. And so French legal terms replaced most of the native English terms. 
and that left us with a legal legacy dominated by French and Latin words. Next time, we'll look at the last portion of Henry II's reign. This will include conflict and war with his wife and sons. The end of his reign was also marked by the appearance of the next major manuscript composed in English. This text is called the Ormulum. It was apparently drafted near the end of Henry's reign, and it's a remarkable document because it tells us a lot about the state of the English language at the end of the 12th century. So next time, we'll look at that document in some detail. Until then, thanks for listening to the History of English podcast. 